David, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's just, it's really great to be here. I am, uh, I'm overwhelmed and I'm, I'm humbled that I was, I was asked to join you for this really special uh, occasion. Um, I want to begin by um, honoring Erica Amoritsugu. Erica, where are you? There you are. Uh, the President of the United States relies on her every day uh, to help lead the country uh, in so many special ways. She was my partner. She, we worked right down the hall from each other for two years until the President kicked me out of the White House just on Friday afternoon. Uh, so, Erica, thank you for representing the President. Uh, I didn't get to see the mayor earlier today, or Hilda, uh, but David, thank you for introducing everybody, and I won't go through the protocol that's been established, but uh, Jim, and by the way, I don't, I don't know why you're confused. The first thing I thought about when I met her, I said, what's a white lady from South Africa doing <laughs> running this museum? It was the first thing I asked her. I don't know if it was inappropriate or not, but it was the first thing that came to mind. So people do wonder. And they may be afraid to ask you, but of course, overwhelmed to hear about uh, the incredible experiences that you've had in your life. And thank you for that. And David, thank you. And to uh, the Mineta family, Danny, uh, my dad passed two years ago. And so that really kind of took my heart away uh, looking at Norm up there. I'm not trying to make you cry, but he was really handsome. He really was. And, and you know, when you look at that, and I hope that they get to play the rest of it, uh, he has eyes that only a person with a great heart can have. They smile all the time. And I think that really kind of is a reflection of what was in his soul and why he was so special uh, to all of us. And on behalf of uh, the brothers, um, David talked about my oldest sister, Mary. She would say she's the wisest in our family, but there are nine of us. And the oldest always does that. <laughs> and sometimes they're right, but your brothers kind of bowed up a little bit on that, just to, <laughs> in any event, it's an honor to, to be with all of you at uh, the Democracy Center for the inaugural Norman Mineta Distinguished uh, Lecture Series to pay tribute to Secretary Mineta, whose life and legacy embody what it means to overcome the worst of humanity and then to commit one's life to find the best of it. Here in Little Tokyo, this Democracy Center serves as a beacon of hope and a beacon of faith in America, a reminder that when we come together, we can actually build an enduring democracy and preserve freedom for us all. And I'm so pleased to see that the Center's work now bears the name of another American hero, Senator Danny Inouye, who my sister, Senator Mary Landrieu, served with in the United States Senate, as Danny said, for 16 years. I am mindful, too, that I stand on hallowed ground, a designated National Historic Landmark where 37,000 37, Southern California residents were ordered, mandated, to report after the signing of Executive Order 9066, forcibly removed 120,000 Japanese Americans from their homes and transported them to American incarceration camps on American soil during World War II, a fact that not many people know, incidentally, and amazingly enough. I know that Secretary Manette and his family were held against their will for several years in the Heart Mountain internment camp in Cody, Wyoming, their freedom and their liberty stolen. And yet, and yet, and yet, Despite all of the injustices he and his family faced, including getting barred from becoming citizens when they first moved to the United States, he never, never gave up on America's promise. He went on to build a life of public service, becoming the first Asian American mayor of a major city, a 10-term member of Congress, secretary of the departments, Departments of Commerce and Transportation, the first Asian American appointed to a presidential cabinet, and perhaps most importantly, in times like this of great division, it's helpful to remember that Secretary Mineta served both Democrat and Republican presidents. Can you imagine? He lived the truth of America's founding motto, that out of many, we are one. E pluribus unum. 
Now, since our birth, we have been a nation that rises or falls on our willingness to live up to one very simple but profound idea that we all come to the table of democracy as equals. The government that we chose is designed to protect us and to promote that one central idea. If that idea dies, we, as America, die with it. And so as we stand here today, January 26, 2024, in the year of our Lord, that idea is in imminent danger of risk. It is being threatened by those who want our country to work for some people, not for all, who believe that might makes right, who would rather cloak us in darkness rather than bathe us in light. That is why, as defenders of democracy, we all have a choice to make right now. This is a scary time, but this is a time that calls us all to find our courage because, as Ann told me the other day, wherever there is repression, it requires resistance. And so I, each, I ask each of you, how will you respond to our freedoms that are under attack? In times past, we have looked at our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, to help guide us. Our founders gathered in Philadelphia that 248 years ago to not only declare our independence from Great Britain, but to form a new government. This government is a republic. In this republic, rights and responsibilities do not trickle down from a king or a queen, not from a dictator, nor an authoritarian leader. It comes from the people, the people. That is why we say of the people, by the people, for the people. And the aspiration of a young, optimistic, striving nation has always been to become a more perfect union. This is a humble acknowledgement that we were born imperfect and therefore we have more work to do. The ideals that we want to protect are under attack, but my fellow Americans, they are worth fighting for. And our fight today starts first by talking about what truly makes America great. It starts by reclaiming American patriotism, by reclaiming our democracy, by continuing to lift up the ideals of that more perfect union that are rooted in freedom, rooted in justice, rooted in equality. One where we acknowledge that diversity is our strength and indivisibility is our superpower. In the years since our founding, we have seen brave citizens rise to answer the call on behalf of all America. We have to listen to them all. From journalist and educator Ida B. Wells, who said that the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. To Yuri Kochiyama, the Japanese-American civil rights leader, who was sent to an internment camp and later helped prepare reparations for our community. She worked alongside black civil rights leaders to advance racial justice, and she said, and I quote, remember that consciousness is power. Tomorrow's world is yours to build. Through these words, we are summoned to seek the truth. Through these words, we are summoned to rebuild together. Today, however, we are witnessing a poisonous campaign to shroud us in darkness, in ignorance, and once again, fear. All across our nation, like the cult of the lost cause, we have people in power who are making it their mission to erase history and limit what our children learn in school. They're working to ban the teaching of civil rights, of black history, of LGBTQ history, anything other than a sanitized story of a past that never was. And those same misguided leaders are mounting a dangerous campaign to ban books, to dictate the stories we tell in America and whose we cast aside and forget. We cannot allow our history to be erased. Teaching our children a whitewashed version of our history is a disservice to them, and it's a threat to our future. And to state a simple but obvious truth, you can learn a lot more by reading a book than you can if you bury one. If our children cannot see just how long the arc of the moral universe is, how can they bend it towards justice? Bearing the truth is a disservice to our nation as well. If we're truly going to live up to the principles of our founding fathers, we have to embrace our nation's full past, its pain, its promise, its struggles, its triumphs, and yes, our failures, instead of denying where we've been. How else 
could one learn to fix what is broken? Repair what has been damaged. Make tomorrow better than today. Take that necessary step to a more perfect union. As Secretary Mineta reminded us over 36 years ago, we cannot shrug our shoulders at our past. This, my friends, means looking closely at the original sin of slavery, at Jim Crow, at the internment, at the legacy of racism that these and other systems have left behind. And yes, despite what some might say, just recently, it means teaching our children the true cause of the Civil War, which was slavery. That's an open book test. We cannot, we cannot, cannot let a backward looking vision of who we are win. The truth of our past must win. The future must win. Together, together must win. Because as Dr. King reminded us so eloquently, we are caught in an escapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. We must face our past and our future together. They are the same. But today, we're facing division and hate. We're witnessing extremism that threatens the very foundation of our democracy. We faced immigrant children being ripped from the arms of their parents and detained in horrific conditions. We've seen blanket bans on travelers from Muslim majority country. President Trump ref re referred to fellow human beings as vermin, even poisoning the blood of Americans. I want you to notice here how dehumanizing this language is. You see, dehumanization is the first step towards licensing hate and hurt and gives you freedom to do things that people should never do to other people. We've seen Supreme Court justices uh, who have taken back the rights of women to make decisions about their own bodies, enabling elected officials, if you can believe it, to implement draconian bans on abortion, allowing home searches of mothers who have just miscarried their children and bringing them before the bar of justice. We're seeing attempts to make it harder to vote and to limit who we can marry. We cannot allow this assault on freedom to continue. And thankfully, it is still within our power to choose, to choose a different future. It is in our power to choose freedom and liberty. Together, we have to step up as full participants in this democracy as, yes, citizens. We have to resist the temptation to surrender our collective power to those hell-bent on dragging our country backwards. Our responsibility our sacred responsibility as citizens calls us to use our hard-earned freedoms that we have now to speak out against these injustices, to call upon our elected officials to protect vulnerable communities, and to vote, yes, to stand up and vote, the most powerful thing you can do in record numbers. Now, I understand, and you understand, and you know that too many people are feeling lost. They're feeling left behind. They're feeling powerless. They're feeling afraid and they're feeling complacent right now. A recent study even showed that 38% of Americans are avoiding the news because it's too hard to watch. So let me be clear about the risk here. They're coming for our books. They're coming for our marriages. They're coming for our bodies. They're coming for our rule of law. If you haven't noticed, it's all connected. So you gotta step up. You gotta speak out. And just think for a minute, if they came for all that stuff, what do you think they're going to come for next? And whom do you think they're going to come for? At this time, when so much has us pulled apart, go ahead a little bit, we must continue the work we've been doing together in red states and in blue states to rebuild our country. Literally, the work is at the heart of our call to fight for all communities because when we work together, very simple thought, we can do big things. Now, as mentioned, I had the distinct honor of serving as mayor of my hometown in New Orleans, where I led the effort to rebuild my great city in the wake of the devastation from Hurricane Katrina. One million people, a million people were displaced. A million homes were destroyed across the Gulf Coast. 250 hurt so bad. Terrible sense of loss and hopelessness. But we came together. We found the courage 
and the fortitude to rebuild our country in a better, more resilient way. We didn't build it back the way it was. We built it back the way it should have been if we would have gotten it right the first time. That took a little bit of thinking. That's why two years ago, after President Biden passed the biggest infrastructure investment since President Eisenhower, he called on me to carry out that vision as we rebuild America. And as senior advisor to the president, our team has already pushed out $400 billion for roads and bridges and airports and ports and waterways and sewer systems, high-speed internet, clean energy economy. I was just here last year, $1.8 billion for the blue line. And just a couple of months ago, the president announced $6 billion for high-speed rail, which, by the way, is going to be operating by the time y'all hook us up with the Olympics. <laughs> I mean, go get them. <laughs> we launched over 40,000 projects in every corner of the country. I've traveled over 120,000 miles. I've been to 150 cities, towns, counties, and community with these projects, and that's why we're ushering in a new future, a bright future, a future which everyone can breathe clean air. Everyone is going to have clean water to drink. A future in which everyone has the opportunity to build generational wealth. Everybody, all of us. A future in which the most vulnerable communities aren't forced to bear the brunt of our progress but can participate in it. That is why I have hope. I have hope because what I've seen become possible. And I have faith because we're rebuilding the right way, ushering in a future in which our nation leads not only in technology, innovation, and manufacturing, but in equity and justice as well. You can do them both at the same time. We are well on our way to realizing our vision of an America as it should be. Now, my friends, my fellow Americans, my fellow citizens, there are some moments in history that are more critical than others. And this is one of them. As the president has said many times, we are at an inflection point, one that really matters. This is truly a time for choosing. And the choices that we make in this moment will set the course for future generations, many of them. We must meet this moment with resolve. And we must answer a very simple question. Who are we? Who are we? This is a time for us to come together as patriots, as citizens who love this great but imperfect country and choose to make her better. We must choose to reclaim America as the big tent that we were always intended to be, the forward-looking, aspirational version of America our founders set out to create 240 years ago. To say in word and deed that we are better together than we are apart. It is in this quest and search for truth that real patriotism is rooted and flourishes. It is in this idea that our democracy lives on, in a functioning democracy. The fight for our freedom is waged on the battlefield of ideas where we negotiate our differences within a frame of government that is designed to help individuals to learn to live together despite our differences. That, my friends, is what pluralism is all about. In a free and functioning democracy, we adhere to free and fair elections, the peaceful transition of power, respect for the rule of law, separation of powers, a free and independent judiciary, and an allegiance to the governing framework of the Constitution, was, which does not include insurrection or the assassination of political enemies, election denial, history denial, science denial, climate denial, and the willingness to use political violence to not only maintain power but to, not, but to deny its peaceful transition means that you do not believe in the idea of America, its people, and its institutions. You, had, you have entered the zone of delusion because when you seek to divide and destroy America, you are no longer entitled to call yourself a patriot. You have become the thing that you most hate, a traitor. It does not have to be this way. We can claw ourselves back from the edge America need not lose another 750,000 sons and daughters and mothers and fathers in a civil war on the soil of this beloved land 
to know, to relearn what history has already taught us, that we are better together. Our diversity is our strength. Our indivisibility is our superpower. Let's not throw all of that away. The lessons of our past, including the dark history of internment during World War II, have taught us that freedom is not free. It is only purchased with sacrifice. The kind of sacrifice that Norm Mineta and Danny Inouye made, even after suffering, humiliation imposed by an imperfect nation who lost her way because she was afraid. Standing together, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder, if we protect knowledge, strengthen freedom, and rebuild together, our democracy will not only survive, but it will grow stronger. And the words of Daniel Inouye will remain true that in America, as 200 years ago, the people, the people still rule. And so like Norm Mineta, who we're here to honor tonight, I have hope and I have faith because I, like him, believe in the American people. So I know we can. I know we must. I know we will. My friends, believe this. This nation has not yet begun to scratch the surface of her greatness. And we will not find that more perfect union if we do not protect our freedom. Freedom. Freedom is everything. Freedom is all. Thank you all very much, and God bless America. What an opportunity to actually continue uh, discussion. And I think at first I, I was thinking um, about this discussion, I was thinking, I think people want to know a little bit more about you, Mitch. Um, you know, similar to what you were saying about it. So how does, how does the blonde lady lead the Japanese American National Museum? It's like, um, I called it a white lady. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, well, the, the blonde white lady, but with, with the South African accent. Uh, similarly, I mean, I think because of your eloquence talking about diversity, racism, and uh, and here's this this white southern man talking about you know fighting racism and justice and diversity. Um, this is the story of your family, Mitch. Tell us about you know I think just your family, uh, your dad's story. Um, Tell us a little bit more about the Landers. Well, <laughs> well, the Landers are like roaches. I mean, we got like, there are a lot of us. I have, my, <laughs> my, my mother, my mother, who was a saint and still with us today, had nine children in 11 years. Think about that. And then she got stuck with me. I mean, that's like a whole nother thing. She was like, Lord have mercy. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question because I was, um, you know, you don't have anything to do with where, you, where you're born, who you're born to, you know, like what the deal is. So I was, I was born in 1960 in the, in the Deep South uh, in New Orleans, which sold more people into slavery, I think, than most every other place. Maybe there's one or two places, but I mean, we were kind of in it. Um, and the story is really more interesting about my dad than me because, you know, just like that's where you come from. But my father was born in 1930 uh, in the city of New Orleans, across the street from a cemetery, to a mother that had an eighth grade education and a father that had a third grade education, and uh, lived in a house that was, I don't know, 18 feet wide and 60 feet deep. He slept in the storeroom. He said, I, you know, my, I, I wasn't like terribly poor, I didn't miss a meal, but I realized that since I was sleeping in a storeroom, other kids had more than me. <laughs> and uh, and he, he kind of grew up, he had one brother, and uh, got himself a scholarship to Jesuit High School. Y'all probably have one of those around here. Y'all got Loyola, right? We have one of those. <laughs> and, uh, and 
he was a pretty good athlete in high school, and he found himself at Loyola University, and there was a priest there named Father Toomey who was very um, passionate about social justice. And in the law school, Father Toomey and some of the Jesuits in the Deep South were really pushing hard on social justice, and they got in my daddy's head and started chit-chat with him about this. But the story really starts with his first day of law school when he meets a guy named Norman Francis who is an African-American male from the South. So now this is 1954, okay? And Norman's the first African-American to walk into Loyola Law School. And on that first day, my father and Norman met and became best friends for their entire life. Um, my father wanted to be with Norman, but they wouldn't let Norman go places. And my father started feeling the sting of this and their life's commitment to each other, much like Alan and Norman, you're Norman, really informed their lives. And by the way, I got very interested in, in this idea of Alan Simpson meeting your daddy when he was a little Boy Scout, when your daddy was running around that camp, one of them free, the other not. And the impact, not that it just had on Norman, but what is the impact that it had on Alan? And how did it transform the way he was able to see the world? Because when he went back to his white place that he lived in, a very white state, and he didn't see people like Norman, and people started bad-mouthing Japanese Americans, all of a sudden Alan had confronted the reality that Norman Mineta was really a great-looking kid, happy and funny, hit stickball, probably better athlete than Alan. But that's what Norman turned out to be for my father. So I remember asking my daddy, I said, Dad, how, when did you first, like, when did you first have any inkling of race as a problem? He goes, really, when I was about in third grade. And I said, well, how, how did that, what do you mean? He goes, well, I, what I remember most is when I was on the street and folks would be walking up and down the street because we had a lot of people in our neighborhood. If you live in New Orleans, we're all kind of hang out in the street. He said, what I first remember is that when an African-American man came by, they would call him his first name. And he said, when everybody else came by, no matter what their station in life was, they called him Mr. And he goes, that's the first time I knew that we treated people differently who were the same because the black folks were really nice to me and the white folks not as much. And he said the second time was when Norman came to law school and Norman was better looking than me, he was smarter than me, he was faster than me. I'm not gonna say his wife was better looking than your mother, but Blanche was really cute too. <laughs> and he said, so I was confronted with my white friends who I knew weren't as good as Norman. They weren't as fast as Norman, they weren't as smart as Norman, and they kept acting better than him. And I said, well, why did you fight so hard for Norman? This is the greatest insight, that my, one of the greatest insights that my father ever gave me. He said, Mitch, I wasn't fighting for Norman. He says, I was fighting for me. I said, well, I don't understand that. What do you mean? Because everybody says you were, you know, civil rights. He goes, no, 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 I was fighting for myself. Norman made me better. He made me faster. He made me smarter. Now, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, is that Norman Francis went on even though he graduated from law school, to be the president of Xavier University and lived his life out and has been the longest serving president of an African-American HBCU in the country. And that school produces, has produced more doctors from the African-American community than any school in the country. He has a presidential freedom of honor. He's still alive today. And his entire life, all of his kids and all of our kids have been best friends our whole life and they've informed who we are because we could not, when looking at the Francis's, deny the reality that color is a social construct and that if you really want to think about excellence and you want to think about this thing called e pluribus unum and you really believe that diversity is a strength and you really don't mind competition, do you hear what I'm not saying? <laughs> if you really want to compete with the best and the brightest, seems to me, if you feel really good about yourself, you want to let everybody on the playing field. But people talk a good game about competition and merit, but when everybody shows up, they go, oh, I didn't know all those people were coming. Can I please still run my daddy's company when I got a C? Y'all know, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? So in any event, we, 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 my father grew up that way. And, and when he was 29 years old, he, uh, he, he, had, he had five kids. Uh, my mother was in utero with me when my father got elected to the House of Representatives and my daddy got sworn in on a cow field 
uh, in LSU's campus, and Jimmy Davis took the oath of office, and during his speech said that segregation forever, just like Wallace. I was in utero. My mother was sitting there with me, and there were four kids at home. My father went to the Capitol, and one of his first votes was a bill to maintain segregation in Louisiana, and he found, I don't know how he did it. I mean, really, it's unbelievable. He found the courage. He's 29. He's got four babies at home that are under five years old, six years old. His wife is pregnant, and he votes against the segregationists in Louisiana, which at the time were really a big deal. And that night, when he was going into his hotel, he got cornered in the uh, elevator by Leander Perez. So this is why I love you already, and I just met you. <laughs> but they pointed a finger at my father with uh, Leander Perez and Willie Rainick, who were the two great racists in southern uh, Louisiana, and they said, you're dead. And they threatened his life. And they, they just didn't mean politically. They meant figuratively, but they meant politically too. Well, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would tell it, is my father went on to be a council member at large. He became the mayor of a city. He became the secretary of housing and urban development. And he has 38 grandchildren and 16 great-great-grandchildren before he passed. So, anyway. Don't let, bully, don't let bullies, the point of that is don't let bullies scare you. Just kind of do what you need to do because there are a lot of bullies out there who are trying to scare you. And in the mouth of Donald Trump right now, um, he is saying the thing that these people, look, there's nothing going on up on the federal level that hasn't gone on in the South for the last 100 years in this country. It's the same stuff. You could go back and get the speeches of Bull Connor and Willie Rainick and George Wallace, and you can put them in the mouth of President Trump, and you know exactly where they came from. And you can predict what it is they're going to say, which is, uh, if you don't do what I'll tell you, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to lynch you. I'm going to rape you. I'm going to make sure that you can't own property. I'm going to figure out that if you're against me, I'm going to punish you because I'm stronger than you. See, I'm bigger than you. I'm smarter than you. And even if I'm not, I'm going to take it anyway because I can. Might is right. And we lived through that our entire lives. So this is not a surprise. The only surprise that I have right now is that so many Americans seem susceptible because of fear, which is what exactly happened and what allowed the internment to happen because we couldn't distinguish between people and the color of their skin. And the fear that people had allowed them to do something that they thought they would never do that was contrary to the ideals of this country. And so we just, you know, we, we were on, my dad was on the side of standing up. And, uh, and we kind of, I don't know, we kind of got some of that. Well, I think, I think, I don't know your other eight siblings, but they're um, not as wise as I am. I, I, <laughs> not exactly where I was going. Sorry. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I was just busting you up. Sorry. I'm doing that for the little brothers. Know, sorry, I'm, I see, I'm the there. fifth. I'm the fifth child. <laughs> I'm the one. Uh, by the way, my mother would deny this. But when you have nine kids, you can't fit everybody in the car. And you generally take the oldest four and then you take the youngest four. And then the middle kid. I mean, I'm like, really get left behind like a lot. Y'all can tell that it made me really shy. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Mitch talking to? Oh I, don't, my you know, God. I don't know. He's, he's talking to somebody. You know, so it's clear. It's that kind of courage, I think, that, that you were talking about, Mitch. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, can make folks a little nervous. It makes me nervous. I'm thinking like, man, we're, it's, it's tough times. We got to stand up. Part of, I think, the community D DNA in the Japanese American community is 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 an understanding of that is an understanding of um you know racism obviously what it does to you and the, to the community what it can do um our dna is different it's forever changed it's forever different so i love hearing your example of your dad and then clearly it's shaped your trajectory Standing up to bullies. Um, talk a little about about your, you know, you, your career, because you were a poli sci major, theater major. Yeah, I was a theater. Theater, major. The theater major. Was there, was there another turn you were going to take? Was it Holly? I don't know what. No, the the, the, uh, the it, default was the politician. I did not want to. I, did not, I wanted my my love and my my first love in my life was to to sing on Broadway. 
No, I really, I was actually a professional actor when I was a kid. I was a pretty good singer. I'm a tap dance for y'all right now. <laughs> but no, when I was at, seriously, when I was, at, when I was younger, I, all I wanted to do was be a, an actor and sing on Broadway and do musicals. And I, that's what I wanted to do. And from a young time, I took dance lessons and singing lessons and all that stuff. And I was in my high school plays. I was a pretty good tennis player. Um, and when I, when I got around to going to college, I, I want, I'm kind of a... Uh, uh, I'm peripatetic. I like, or I have an attention deficit disorder. I'm not sure, but I like doing a lot of stuff, and I like them doing it all at one time, and I like being able to do them all well. So I don't know what you call that, but I needed a school that would, could accommodate my craziness, <laughs> and so I went to Catholic University of America in Washington D.C. for a lot of different reasons. One, because they had a great theater school. Two, they had a good political science department. Three, they had a bad tennis team that I could be on which I played four years of tennis on and I uh, was the captain my last year, but so you know it was, really wasn't that good. I kept telling the coach, I said, you know, now that I'm the captain, we need lots of scholarships. And I told him this like eight times. He finally got, you know, got enough of me being in his ear. And he said, so come, come over here. He said, you've now told me eight times that we need scholarships and I've heard you each time and I haven't responded to you. Have you noticed? And I said, yes, sir. He goes, because it's really simple. If we get scholarships for tennis players, you won't make the team. <laughs> In any event, um, I, uh, I, 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 was, I was obviously, I was 18 to 22 when I was in college, but I had gotten my professional equity, my card, my equity uh, union card when I was 16 doing professional theater in New Orleans. And I actually have been on a USO tour. I've been on two of them, actually. Um, and one summer, which is an important part of my life, I was, I was uh, on behalf of the State Department with a team of students went over to Poznan, Poland to teach the history of the American musical theater to the top 500 Polish students that we had teams of teachers over there teaching them lots of stuff and my thing was, was the, the history of the American musical theater. And while I was over there, I decided to take a trip and I went to Auschwitz. I, I was by myself or with another student and um, I remember I was in the gates of Auschwitz and I walked through it. If anybody's been there, I don't know if you have, uh, you should go if you can. And if you can't go to the one in Washington DC, but the real place. And it, is, it just breaks you down. Um, and you stand there and you think about how in the world were human beings who had some, at some point in time been decent allowed themselves and their government to exterminate other human beings in that level of atrocity. And I remember standing there, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I might have been 20, and started thinking about slavery in America and said, gosh, it happened here. It happened on our soil. Could it happen again? And I remember very vividly committing myself that day to making sure that if I had anything to do with it, that it would never happen. And then I would have to find the courage, if ever called upon, to do what is necessary. Now, not too many years later, when I was 28, so now eight years later, I learned a couple of things about myself. I wasn't as good at theater as I thought. My father offered to send me to law school. I met my wife, the woman that I was going to marry, although she refused to go out with me for a long time. <laughs> and I got married. And right after that, my sister Mary, who was in the state legislature, ran for state treasury, and I ran for her seat, opened a law practice, got married, got pregnant all at the same time. My wife got pregnant. <laughs> and uh, one year after that, one year, David Duke the leader of the Ku Klux Klan got elected to the state legislature in a legislative district right next to New Orleans, where the people who didn't like living with black people in New Orleans went to live because they didn't want to live with certain people, which is, this is how close we all are to each other. It's not like them over there. It's us right here. It's at your kitchen table. It's at Thanksgiving dinner. Do y'all understand what I'm saying to you? It's not people over there that are feeling the way. It's like right here. And we've all marched side to side by this. And David Duke got to this legislature. And I'm sitting here thinking, ah, this is really weird. Because I remember where I was eight years ago. And I didn't think that it could ever happen again. But if it could, it would happen in Louisiana maybe. And it started to. And when David Duke decided that he was going to run for governor, run for the United States Senate, he got two out of every three white votes. 
in Louisiana. Now, I can't explain to you how then I got elected statewide and Mary got elected statewide, me twice, her, her four times, before now the state has completely changed. But what I'm saying to you is that root of race and the inability to see other people as fully human has been with us for a very long period of time. It has never left us. And I'm here to tell you because I think I know this. It can happen again. But what you have to do is to stand up against it. Now, I really want to be clear about something because I don't want you to think that I'm, a, I'm an overly courageous person. I'm not. You have to find it. I'm not telling you don't be afraid. You should be afraid. You should be really afraid, especially right now. Do not close your eyes to the moment that we have in front of us. I, I don't want to be overly histrionic about this because every day is important. You have to earn your freedom every day. You've got to earn your citizenship every day. It's not free. But there are some moments in history that are more important than others, that are, that are part of a tectonic shift that is occurring right now. And I would encourage you all to just take a minute and think about this and read about it, that maybe World War I, maybe the civil rights movement, you know, but certainly right now, with the election of Donald Trump in 2016, he is a symptom of a much larger problem. He didn't create this. He's not smart enough to do that. He really is not, but he is feral. And like good politicians with malintent, they can sense where opportunities are. And if they are not curbed by noble leanings and thoughts of democracy and only care about themselves and autocracy and are able to use fear to separate people because it, it provides them an opportunity to satisfy their interest of notoriety and power and money, they then will do what they have to do. And unfortunately, what we're seeing now with misinformation is too many of our fellow American citizens are beginning to normalize things that are outside of the bounds of our democracy framework. Let me, let me see if I can explain it just to you this way, because I've been really working hard to try to figure out how to take a complex idea and make it simple. Because when you say, hey, can I save you democracy? That's like nice. They say, yeah, that's nice. Can you save me um, the cost of a dozen eggs? I want to talk about the economy. I don't want to talk about democracy. It seems so, you know, of the people, by the people, for the people. What do you mean? Let me kind of explain it to you like this. It's Thanksgiving. We're all with our family at our house. Now, I want you to imagine nine Landrews, 38 kids, 64 first cousins, aunts and uncles who are now all over the place. Some of us on the left, some of us on the right, some of us in the middle, and we're in the house, and it's Thanksgiving. And people are being how they be during Thanksgiving. You understand what I'm saying? Well, uncle and aunt and cousins are getting out of the way. And we're now talking about who got a COVID shot and who didn't get a COVID shot and who likes this and who likes that and who's for Trump and who's for Biden, right? And who's for Djokovic and who's for whoever. That's kind of what democracy is like. But inside that house, we all live there. We love each other unconditionally, although we don't like each other every day. We're fighting about who's going to cut the grass. We're fighting about what color we're going to paint the room. We're fighting about who's supposed to take the garbage out. And all of a sudden, somebody hears a noise and says, what the hell is that? And they look outside. And one of your crazy, crazy uncles is outside with a blowtorch that's about to burn the whole house down. That's where we are. I'm not kidding you. That's where we are. And half of the people in the house are going, you know what? I think it's a good idea. Burn that sucker down. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, but we're all in here. <laughs> Don't you think there's a better way to make Uncle Frank a little bit happier? <laughs> that maybe it's not the right way to solve that problem. And so I don't want to dismiss anybody that is fearful and that is afraid or that is hurting right now. We have gone through in this country a really difficult couple of years. I want you to just to think about it. If you're a kid and you're under 30 years old, I mean, think about what you suffered in the first 30 years, 23 years of the, of the, of the 21st century. You have September 11th. You had Katrina. If you're in Louisiana, you had Katrina, Rita, Ike, Gustav, the National Recession, the BP oil spill. That's a God's truth. That's not a joke. You can have, when are the locusts coming? It's like, what the hell is happening? 
Then all of a sudden, we have this election in 2016, which upended everybody's sense of security in the country because now you're wondering about what the heck is really going on. And it's like, is it real? Does it make any sense? And then you think, yes, it does. Then, no, it doesn't. Then we have an election, and people go, yeah, but that didn't really happen the way you just saw it happen. And no, those 8 million votes weren't real. And by the way, there are a lot of ghosts and boogeymen all over the place that you can't see. And then the guy that's president of the United States says, oh, hell, oh, no, I won't go. And leads an insurrection. It was an insurrection. That's what it was. And while COVID is with us, it's starting to kill hundreds of thousands of people. And people are starting to say, well, it's no problem. You don't, don't worry about it. Just drink some Clorox. You could be good. <laughs> so you can't, you can't really get mad at people for being like, what the heck is going on? Because the leaders are saying things that are not true based on bad information. So I think that, that those of us that are really kind of pushing on this issue have to recognize that I am not saying, clearly not saying, that you have to be a liberal Democrat or a progressive Democrat or a moderate or a Republican. Liz Cheney and I probably don't agree on any substantive issue. If we got in a discussion about the size of government, the scope of government, whether or not trickle-down economics works or bottom-up economics works or whether or not you know, what day of the week, you know, we like to play tennis on. We are more likely than not going to go, I like you, but I really don't agree with anything you say. Kind of like Norman Allen. <laughs> Is that true or not true? Yeah. I bet you if you, yeah. if you look at their voting records, right. I bet they ain't, they, they're not too friendly. Yeah. Yeah. But they had dinner together. So all I'm saying now is notwithstanding the fact that let's use Liz Cheney and me. We're good, two good examples. The one thing we agree on, the most important thing that we agree on, is the simple idea that we all come to the table of democracy as equals. And we have this form of government that, by the way, and all of y'all know this, I don't need to give y'all a civics class. The whole point of the way the Constitution is designed is not to, to make us all alike. It assumes that we're all different. And it gives us a way to navigate our differences in peace, in freedom, and in liberty because pluralism and diversity is a strength that no other nation in the history of the world has ever had. That's the very idea. That's why we constructed it that way. And if we don't allow that framework to sit, then people who look different and act different and love different and care different and have different theories and values of their life can't live here. You see, because only those of us that are right can. And only those that have power can. And then America becomes an isolated country, an inward-looking country, a nativist country. And then we get small and we atrophy. And that is what we do not want to happen, which is why today, and I'll, and I'll just end with this, you, you have to stand up. You don't, we don't have to engage in political violence. You have to just go vote. And everybody's got to go. And this battle, by the way, this is what's hard for each of you here. This battle, by the way, is taking places in your houses. It's taking place in the grocery store. It's taking place at the tennis club or the paddleball club, if y'all getting into that. <laughs> it's taking place in the place where you get your hair done or your nails done. It's getting, taking place where you shop. It's taking place in your family gatherings and your weddings and the things that you do. That's where this battle is being done. It's not, do not believe that is the people in the urban areas fighting the people in the rural areas. That is not true. That is a lie. There may be some semblance to bigger patterns like this, but we are so interbound and interwoven with each other. And, and therefore, what it requires is of each of us is to testify every day in the way that we act and the way that we are with other people to, in the battle place of ideas to convince them that no matter how bad they're feeling, Burning the house down is going to burn all of us and not just help some of us. It, so, Mitch, before we go, and I, I, I think you've made it very clear for us, uh, very clear tonight. Um, you said something on, our, on the call the other day about, um, you know, being familiar folks not shutting yourself off, right? And and the more you know folks, you know, or you interact with a diversity of folks, um, the better it off it is for our democracy. What would, what do you mean by that? What 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 were you talking about? Well, I don't, you know, I, um, I 
I say this thing all the time, the diversity is a strength. It's not a weakness. I, I thought that everybody in America thought that. I really did. That's the way I grew up. But evidently, I don't know, I turned on the TV one night. Don't hate me for this, but I was watching Tucker Carlson. <laughs> and he's yelling at the camera. He's yelling at the camera. He's mad. This guy keeps saying diversity is a strength, not a weakness. No, it's not. Diversity is a weakness. And it occurred to me that everybody didn't think like I did. <laughs> but I thought that was just so dumb. And I don't, I don't, I don't have a degree in anthropology. I just got a like degree in common sense. Okay? And I have a degree in being inquisitive and liking things that other people have that I don't have, like high intelligence, <laughs> like creative things that I don't know how to do, like music that I may not have heard about or a book that I may not have read or an idea or a piece of culture that, that I've never really experienced. And I thought, you know, because I, I do believe in God, God doesn't make mistakes. And so this is what I tell all my religious people, all my, all my white Christian nationalist people who believe in God and tell me, you know, I'm a, I'm a Bible-driven dude. I'm like, yeah, me too. And if you believe in God, God does not make trash. So like, why are you hating on everybody if you believe God? So I don't understand that. It doesn't make any sense to me. They're like Mike Johnson, who's from the, the Speaker of the House, he's from Louisiana, said that he's driven by the Bible. And I'm like, yeah, no, I understand that. I read, I read the Gospel of Matthew the other day. And it says when they were trying to um, figure out a way to have a reason to crucify Jesus and the Sadducees and the Pharisees were trying to kind of confuse him and they said to him, that's Jesus. <laughs> I shouldn't, calling, you see, I shouldn't have talking yeah, about it. Calling, Being Christian is my faith walk, so I'm going to give you this story. So when they were trying to kind of, kind of you know, hem him all up, so they could find a reason to say, hey, you got to you know, put that guy up on the, the cross. They said, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, because oh, you know, there are 10 of those things. <laughs> and they're mostly thou shall nots. I mean, all of them are, thou shall not. It's like, don't be a bad person, don't do this. But he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God. You shall, it's a positive thing, not you shall not. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, everything you need to know about everything, about anything that I do is wrapped up in that thing. And so then one of them, who was a smart aleck, said, well, you know, Jesus, that's really nice. But um, when you say you shall love your neighbor as yourself, who is my neighbor? And he was like, you know, your enemy, the homeless, the hungry, the, all this stuff. And so when Mike Johnson, who leads, is a speaker of the house, and says something like, I'm really mad because the president tried to give 10 governors money to feed some kids during the summer when they're hungry. And he says, no, we're not for that. All those governors say, I'm going to church, but no, I'm not for feeding the hungry. I get confused by that, especially since they say the genesis of their thoughts are about the Bible. Now, let me just say this. There's a thing called the separation of church and state in the United States of America. It doesn't say that you can't be religious. It doesn't say you can't love God. It doesn't say you can't practice whatever religion your faith walk takes you to. It says everybody should do it. And we all should learn from each other. And what I've just felt in my life, and I do this to all of y'all, by the way, every one of you that you meet, that I meet, I'm trying to take what you have that's good for me and leave what's bad. Because not all of y'all have all good stuff. <laughs> but all of y'all have some good stuff. And I feel like every one of you has a gift that's unique and different and special. And I would like a piece of it. And so I feel really silly sitting here talking to Japanese Americans who have the history that you have with the experience that you have, who have demonstrated, as I said about your daddy, You've experienced the worst of humanity and you've lived your life in a way to pull out the best from us. And I feel like because of my relationship with Norman Mineta, knowing what his family went through, knowing the 
courage that it took, meaning the overcoming of fear that you should feel because people want to hurt you. I feel blessed by it. And I feel better because of it. And I feel enriched by it. And if I was only hanging around with a bunch of white guys who are fat and bald headed like me, <laughs> I wouldn't be as good as I am. I certainly wouldn't be the person that I am today, good or bad or indifferent. That is why I believe, not because I read it in a book, not because my daddy taught me, not because anything other than my personal experience, and I am enriched by the more people I meet who are more different than me, they can teach me something that I never would have known otherwise. And I'm bigger and I'm better and I'm smarter. And I believe our country will be too. That's why I think that. Thank you, Mitch. Um, I think we, it's very clear why Dad loved two generations of the Landrew family. Uh, That's enough. These people want to get out of here. All right. We've been given the sign. And I think, um, again, I want to thank Mitch for an incredible evening. Um, I think our message, in, uh, Mitch, Mitch's message is very clear. Um, I think we have, uh, we can see the challenge ahead of us. And... Um, the actions uh, that we need to take and the stand up and the courage that we have to muster not only as individuals but as a community, um, as descendants of um, very brave folks. Uh, that call is very clear right now and it must come from this room and this discussion and we must take it out. We have to take this out to the rest of our circles. And I want you to remember Mitch tonight. I want, to, I want you to remember um, the examples he's given us, the examples I think that have, are clear and then have been given from his own experience.